Hello everyone and welcome to this video where I'm going to share with you what in my opinion are the three worst mistakes made by the creators of The Witcher show on Netflix in season 2. I'll try to be relatively brief since I've already complained about most of these things throughout my review series, which by the way you can check in the playlist below if you haven't already. And also let me warn you that as usual this one will be full of spoilers. In no particular order, the first mistake was that they don't know what they're doing. More specifically, that they don't seem to have a coherent plan or a vision of where they wish to take this Witcher franchise. This is quite obvious from the many inconsistencies in Season 2. Not just with the source material, but with Season 1, and quite heavily with Nightmare of the Wolf, and even with some parts of Season 2 itself. In preparation for this video, I quickly went over my reviews and it turns out that episode 7 is the only one out of the 8 videos where I don't bring up some kind of issue with the Vesemir anime. Which not only has it been confirmed as canon, but if you think about it, it's basically the backstory to season 2 in many ways. It introduces Vesemir, the Witchers, the School of the Wolf, the Trials, mutated monsters and so on. And pretty much all of these things are portrayed differently in Season 2. Yes, there are small things that can be ignored, like the fact that other than Geralt, Witchers don't seem to have their yellow cat eyes, which they specifically showed in the anime, or that Netflix decided that all Witchers now travel to Temeria to learn how to cast signs from Mother Nenica herself. I have missed you. Or that despite implying that there were only a handful of witchers left, with no way of making any more, suddenly Geralt says that there are 20 witchers now, without even a passing mention of where the others came from or where they were during the sacking of Kaer Morhen. All this is relatively minor stuff, but we have major issues as well such as completely disregarding the nature of the Witcher Trials and inventing the potentially lore-breaking idea that all it takes to make Witchers for generations onwards is a drop of Elder Blood. And in fact, that Elder Blood itself is at the root of the creation of the Witchers. They made an effort initially to establish this lore about the sect of mages who alone guarded the secrets of combining magic and alchemy and who knows what else to create witchers. Secrets which died with the last of these mages and they threw it all away in Season 2, replacing all these secrets with Elder Blood and the special guild of mages with Triss. And it's a similar case with the nature of the mutated monsters. Half of the anime is about what these monsters are, who made them, how they were made, why they were made, why the witchers took part in it, how these monsters felt, at least some of them, all of this is scrapped in Season 2. We have a whole bunch of mutated monsters again, yet all of them are completely unrelated to anything we see in Nightmare of the Wolf. Philavandro is there as well, but only to be treated like a glorified servant and a breeding tool of Francesca? who doesn't even consider him a partner. I've never had a partner before. All that stuff about the Kitsu's child, which was quite interesting and I was looking forward to more, all of this is gone. Also, one might wonder, why the obsession with mutated monsters? Why not use the regular ones first, and once you run out of options, then create mutants? But anyway, what's even worse, they basically pretended that the mutants who sacked Kaer Morhen didn't even exist. After Eskel turns into a Leshen and dies, which is a problem of its own, I suppose, but after that, Vesemir sits down and says, Death by mutating Lesh. Find that in our annals. And also, do you remember when Vesemir said that there are like five ways to kill a Leshen? There are several ways to kill a Leshen. Head it, sacrifice a few of its furry pets, even a few old dryad spells will do. Which will you? I guess he has forgotten all but one. Fire through the heart is the only thing that puts one down. But in reality none of it matters because you can just slice it in half and be done with it. 
But anyway, some might say, it's just an anime, who cares? But there are issues beyond that as well. For example, there are at least two cases in season 2 where Geralt himself refers to events in the books which Netflix specifically changed or removed. Um, they had the sudden memorial scene, for example, completely different in the show. Yet when Roach died, Geralt made a reference to the original. Be not afraid of her. Same thing in the end when he was talking about destiny to Yennefer. Geralt literally quoted lines from the Golden Dragon in the books and indirectly referred to other events in the books, all of which were removed from the Golden Dragon episode and season 2 in general. Villain Tredden Mirth told us we were made for each other, destined for each other, and that nothing would come of it, because destiny alone is insufficient. Something more is needed. The sorceress will never regain her womb. Though you didn't want to lose her, Geralt, you will. Now, we do have some rumors, actually more than rumors, that at least some of these lines were Henry Cavill's personal idea. Which, if true, is commendable, but ultimately shows that there is no unified vision among the people who are making the show. Triss, stop thinking with your vagina and get a hold of yourself. Oh, and there was also Emir in the final episode, whose character really feels like it was written by two different people. Because first, they do the whole dream sequence where he is the only person who doesn't disintegrate, but then five minutes later they reveal that he's alive and the Emperor of Nilfgaard and also Ciri's father. So what were they trying to do? The dream sequence would have been an incredibly nice way to foreshadow what's about to come, because originally Emir's identity is a secret, but they throw that away immediately because literally five minutes later it is all spelled out and I don't know. To bring up Star Wars again, I'm getting a similar feeling to what happened in episodes 8 and 9, where it felt like Disney was trying to set something interesting up in episode 7, you know, the, the nature of Snoke and Rey and Luke and their relationship, and ultimately, it was all wasted. Okay, that's enough for number one, let's talk about number two in our list. This one can be summarized quite briefly in one word, Yennefer. Way back from my season one reviews, people have been accusing me of hating this show so much. And I've always claimed that hate is too strong of a word for what I truly feel, but I must say, when it comes to the way Yennefer is written in Season 2, hate comes pretty close to what I actually feel. Yennefer in the books is a bitch, but she has class and style and sophistication and magnetism, regardless of whether you love her or hate her, in my opinion at least. And here she's written like an all-powerful, angry, edgy teenager. She swears all the time, and I do mean in pretty much every scene she's in. For fucking up Nilfgaard's great push to north before we get to shit guard. Fuck. That's you give a shit. Fucking part of tricks! It's Dragobor is. A fuckhead. Fuck you! Fuck! 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 Fuck is the point! You left the shit! You left your friend to die in a fucking sewer! You'd shut the fuck up. Fuck. This firefucker was after him. Nice scar, shithead. Firefucker. Firefucker. It comes across as so cheap, especially given that she does all of this while always coming on top of every situation, often defying any logic or reason. I've often responded to people in the comments that one of my favorite parts of the books involving Yennefer is the Dear Friend letter. It's a letter she sends in response to Geralt's letter, where he asks her for help with Ciri. And she's clearly not amused by the fact that he called her his dear friend, and even less so that he sought Triss's help before hers. And this letter is a great summary of her personality in just one page. I should have it on the screen right now, and you should be able to tell how the Yennefer on Netflix, especially in season two, pales in comparison. And there's more too. She feels forced into the story. They're going out of their way to make her have equal or more screen time than Geralt, 
as was the case in season 1 by the way, and in doing so they're robbing other characters from their traits and their personal stories. Here are several examples. They made Yennefer the hero of Sodden, which was originally the title of Vilgefort. They made her Tissaia's favorite student, which originally was Philippa Eilhart. They made Yennefer the last mage who was thought to have died in the Battle of Sodden, but somehow managed to survive. In the books, that is of course Trist Merigold. And they also made her lose her power, which is sort of what happened to Ciri originally in the Korath Desert. So it remains to be seen what they'll choose to do with her in Season 3, but I must say, I have a bad feeling. Which is a shame, because I was somewhat pleasantly surprised with Yennefer in Season 1. Initially, I thought that going into her backstory was a terrible mistake. But I must say, I kind of liked how the actress played Yennefer's younger self in Artuza while being a hunchback and all that. I mean, there were some awkward moments, but it turned out better than I expected. Sadly, it didn't last very long. And before I move on to number three, I should mention how they have so far failed to convey any sort of genuine mother-daughter bond between Ciri and Yennefer. I suppose it's not quite as bad as removing it all from the season like they did with Ciri and Geralt's relationship in season one, and also they still have some time to establish something more between the two in season three. I will go back to this topic after I've seen the next season, but I do, once again, have a bad feeling about it. Okay, time for the last issue with number three which is the lack of geography and world building. The problems here can be summarized fairly briefly, but they're no less important than everything else I've talked about until now. So, Netflix seems to be interested in creating a whole world based on The Witcher books. They will have multiple seasons of the show, multiple animated films, a prequel show, and so on. In fact, there's an entire section on the Netflix catalog dedicated to The Witcher. Yet so far, I'd say Nightmare of the Wolf probably did the most in this department, despite being much shorter than the show. Here there are a couple of problems. First, there is no sense of distance or travel whatsoever. In fact, it feels like everyone is teleporting across the world. In the first episodes, Geralt and Ciri went from Sodden Hill to Kaer Morhen. That is an incredibly long journey, going through different countries and possibly places within them that have major significance. Just to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about here, these are roughly the places where the entirety of The Witcher 3 takes place, other than Blood and Wine. So the show is much larger in scale in that regard yet it's not felt at all. And of course there are many more examples than just that one. We had Geralt and Ciri making the trek to Sintra for the exact same time, despite the fact that Geralt travelled all the way from Oxenford and she travelled from Sodden Hill. And of course the cherry on top was Geralt, Yarpen, Ciri and Yennefer riding all the way from Sintra to Kaer Morhen and essentially crossing the entirety of the Northern Kingdoms overnight. Now, I want to stress that this is not simply an issue of size and distance. It also represents a plethora of missed opportunities to flesh out the world that these characters live in. The towns, the countries, the rulers, the people. Uh, we have Redania, Temeria, Kedwin, Edern, Lyria, Rivia. And for two entire seasons, despite the fact that our characters are cruising all over the world, we know little more than the fact that the North is inhabited by racist peasants and poor elves. Uh, and that's all I had, I think. I don't really wish to go into the changes from the books, because this time around there are so many. In fact, it would be much easier to point out the things that were the same. Come to think of it, I can't think of anything that was exactly the same. And yes, there were quite major ones, like Yennefer losing her power, betraying Geralt and Ciri, Geralt forgiving her too easily, Eskel dying, the Wild Hunt openly revealing itself to Ciri, Ciri already being able to control her powers, Emir announcing the fact that Ciri is his daughter, at least so early into the story, 
and so on, but like I said, this video is mostly about the more general issues. However, I suppose you could list the numerous changes from the source material, which pretty much all seem to be for the worse so far, as number 4. So for now, that's it. Tell me how you felt about this season in the comments, and I thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my supporters and YouTube members, and until the next video, which will likely not be about The Witcher Show, stay tuned and be good.